Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this side event. We're going to be talking about both ice sheets this evening, and we're lucky to have two speakers for this side event. We're going to start with Fiona Turner. She's based in Sheffield. She's a PhD student there. She works also for the British Antarctic Survey, and she's going to tell us about ice cores and emulation. So thank you so much, Fiona. <laughs> thank you. Hi everyone, um, first I'd like to thank the Pavilion for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak today. I really appreciate it, it's been a great day of talks. I also want to forewarn you that I was offered this slot two days ago, so my slides are very much put together from talks I've been doing recently, so please forgive me if this is not quite as polished as it should be. 
Um, so before I begin, I'd really like to do a small plug for my funding centre, the Grantham Centre for Sustainable Futures. So they're the reason that uh, I'm attending COP. So it's uh, a collaboration between the University of Sheffield and the Grantham Foundation for the Protection of the Environment. And it's working on inter uh, interdisciplinary research to do with sustainability and climate issues. And they not only train us all to be researchers, but they also want us to be activists, uh, involved in government policy, and spokespeople for the general public about our research. So every year they send a group of us to COP, and um, yeah, it's been a really great experience to see sort of global climate policy. So uh, as an overview to this uh, talk, I'll give a bit of introduction to myself, motivate what my PhD is about, and also show some prelim uh, preliminary results that I've got. So I'm a statistician by qualification. I just finished a master's in statistics when I started my PhD, and I'm based in the School of Maths and Stats at Sheffield. So I've come to paleoclimatology very much from a statistical point of view. Um, and indeed, during the last three years, so I'm now just starting the final year of my PhD, attending paleoclimate conferences, I've really been getting a lot of feedback that what climatologists really want more nowadays is more collaboration with statisticians and getting our methods incorporated uh, into uh, this research. Um, as I said, I'm in the final year, I'm just getting to my final results, but I have put preliminary up there as I haven't quite finished my methodology, so the work I'm showing you isn't quite finished, I haven't quite made sort of my final conclusions, uh, but I still think it's quite interesting to discuss. So this was uh, published in Nature last year, showing the mass balance of the Antarctic ice sheet during the past 15 years. And we can see that although East Antarctica is holding fairly steady, we are seeing quite a dramatic drop, drop in uh, ice mass. Not only is it decreasing, but the speed at which it's decreasing is increasing. So um, this is quite dangerous when you think about uh, how much ice Antarctica holds. It's got 90% of the world's ice on it. And if uh, we lose a sizable amount from either of the two ice sheets, then that is going to be catastrophic for coastal communities. So what uh, climatologists would like to know is, where are these lines going to be moving in the future? Is it going to increase even further, this rate of mass loss? Or is it going to steady out? And how do we need to prepare the coasts? In order to work this out, then we have to turn to past Antarctic ice sheet shapes and understand how they react to climate, uh, changing climates in the past. So the period that I've been looking at is the last glacial maximum. So that's 21,000 years ago, the peak of the previous ice age, and is uh, sort of the most recent time when Antarctica was at a uh, maximum extent. So it might seem strange to be concentrating on an ice age when I'm talking about climate change, but actually there's still a huge amount of uncertainty about the LGM ice sheet shape. So even though it's relatively recent in paleo terms, um, there's still, there's still, we're still not entirely sure just how much ice there was on planet Earth back then. So when current estimates have been melted down from LGM to present uh, levels, we're actually seeing a huge uh, amount, of uh, several meters of sea level missing globally. So that means that there's some missing ice somewhere on the planet, and our best estimate is that it's somewhere in Antarctica. So in order to do these reconstructions, then reliant on proxy data, so this is um, organic compounds that can tell us something about climate. So in my case, I'm working on ice cores. Um, I wasn't sure what sort of audience I'd be getting. I assumed it would be quite general, so I've included a bit on that. So this is basically ice that you're drilling out of the Antarctic ice sheet. And the further down you go, then the older the ice is when it was formed. When you take that core and cut it into slices, then what you get is something like this. So those bubbles are air that was frozen at the point in time when that ice was formed. So when you melt that ice down, you can measure the water isotopes in it. So that's uh, oxygen and hydrogen isotopes. And the ratio of these isotopes to each other tells us a lot about the climate. So things like temperature, precipitation, wind speed. So what I'm trying to do in my research is find the link between ice sheet shape and uh, these water isotopes, specifically delta 18O. So my whole work is seeing, is there a statistical method that will allow us to create a relationship between ice sheet shape and water isotopes? And can we then work backwards from these ice core observations and find what ice sheet shape would give those values? What everyone loves me talking about when I discuss my research is the statistics. So this is the cursory slide on that. I'm sorry if this looks terrifying. I know lots of people who 
would rather I never spoke about statistics ever. But as I'm doing a Bayesian statistics PhD, I feel like I have to mention Bayes' theorem. So I'm sure not many of you recognize this at all, but it is the foundations of Bayesian statistics. It's basically saying that if you're interested in some variable that I call theta and you have observations of it, D, then the probability distribution of theta given these observations is proportional to the distribution of theta multiplied by the distribution of the data given theta. I'm sure that was incomprehensible to most people, so in order to present this sort of statistics at non-statistics conferences, I've come up with an analogy in the universal language of football. <laughs> so if you think back to last year during the World Cup, if you asked a group of English football fans before the football started, what are the chances of England winning? They'd have said pretty much zero. It's really unlikely. England doesn't play football very well anymore. Keep your hopes low. So that is what we would call our prior beliefs. So that's f of theta. That is what we believe about something before we take observations. So if you think of D as us observing the fo English football team playing the group stages, then suddenly they're doing really well and they're winning their games and they're scoring loads of goals. And if you asked English football fans then what they'd think, they'd say, well, we were you know, pessimistic, but given how well they're playing, we're updating our beliefs and saying that England's going to win. Obviously, they didn't. Sorry. <laughs> But this is a really good way of showing just how natural Bayesian statistics thinking comes to people. So we all have prior beliefs about an event. We then observe things to do with that. And hopefully, if you're a rational person, you update your beliefs based on that evidence. So in my research, my prior beliefs are previous reconstructions. So scientists have been reconstructing the Antarctic ice sheets for several decades now. And so that's what I'm using as a starting point. I'm saying that all these ice sheet shapes that I've collected from the literature are a good estimate, and I'm going to see if I can reduce the uncertainty and work out which of them is closest to the truer value. What I'm using as my observations, the D that I had in that equation, are these water isotope values. So I've been spending the last three years trying to work out how we can combine these two things to learn more about the ice sheet shapes. So the way I've done that is these four simple bullet points or well, they sound simple. So to combine Bayesian statistics and paleoclimatology, I've used those ice sheet reconstructions other people have done to build a simple statistical model. This is a linear model using these reconstructions to create my own synthetic ice sheet shapes. It's thrown out all the physics and all the climatology behind it and just treating them as standard numerical variables. I use that model to create an ensemble of ice sheet shapes. I then run that through the Met Office's climate model HADCM3. So this is a climate model in which you, I input uh, last glacial maximum simulations, and each time all I change is the ice sheet shape. And then one of the things it in outputs is isotope estimations, so values of delta 80 now according to that simulation. So I've now got, I'll now have a set of data of ice sheet shapes and then corresponding isotope values. I could then use Bayesian statistics to model this relationship and then compare the ice core values to this model and see if I can find a more accurate ice sheet shape. So yes, it sounds simple. <laughs> um, yes. So I started off, as I said, by collecting these ice sheet shapes. So these are four of them. I got 40 overall from the literature. And you can see that uh, there are some differences. So this top left one is ice 5G. Uh, so that is, uh, very, that is a nice uh, sheet reconstruction which has very high values in the east and is just quite thicker than all the others. And then these bottom two, their, their ice extent is sort of going out a lot more in the Ross and Ron ice sheets. Um, so once I'd collected these shapes, as I said, I wanted to create this model. But hopefully you don't have to be a statistician to think that 40 ice sheet shapes, you can't just combine them all linearly to make a model as that's just going to be way too complicated and convoluted to measure. So I use the dimension reduction technique in statistics called principal component analysis. This basically takes a group of data, looks at how it's all correlated together, sees where the variance and disagreements are, and creates variables which describes this variance. So I ended up with these five variables. Um, so they can be a bit tricky to interpret, but if you think of the blue as negative values and the red as positive values, and as you multiply these variables by a large number, say this one on the right, you'd get uh, very high peaks in the West Antarctic and very uh, low peaks around the coast and so on. So my model ended up looking something like this. 
So this is just a screenshot, but this is an interactive model that I have on my laptop. So these five bars at the minute, at the bottom, are controlling my five prior variables. And as you drag them along those lines, then it determines how much of each variable is being plotted above. And you can create your own ice sheet shape in front of your very eyes, moving it along. So um, I wanted to check what exactly is my model describing and where's the variance in this. So this is the standard deviation of the model. And we can see that the darker values are where there's a lot more uh, disagreement between those reconstructions and the lighter values are where there's less. So we can see that uh, on the East Antarctic ice sheets side, there's not that much disagreement. It's fairly light. But on the West, you have all these patches of dark. And from a climatological point of view, that's what we'd expect. So the East Antarctic ice sheet didn't vary that much during the last glacial maximum. There was very little precipitation as it was so cold, so it wasn't building up size that much. It was staying fairly constant. Whilst the West Antarctic ice sheet was exposed a lot more, and so the, what we, so we're more uncertain about what exactly it was like. <clears throat> so then my next step was to use that model to create the ensemble. So these are four just here. So we can see that um, even though it's based on you know, plausible reconstructions, it's still giving out very varied ice sheet shapes. I should also say that as I'm using HADCM3, I had to use the latitude longitude grid for that, which is very coarse, which is why you get the uh, edges of the ice sheets being a bit clunky and a bit odd. Um, that's something that in our final results we'll have to smooth out in some way. So we took 47 ice sheet shapes and ran them with LGM simulations through HADCM3. And so we had our ice sheet shapes and our delta 18.0. The first thing we wanted to do before we started the analysis was check that what HADCM3 was giving us was similar enough to the observations that we could actually compare them. So I made this plot, which uh, I'm not sure you can see the axes very well, but it's basically plotting um, the corresponding grid value for four ice cores from the West Antarctic ice sheet I've collected. So you've got Bird at the top, and then Mount Molten, Sipple Dome, and WDC, and then it's the same order that way, so they're all plotted against each other. So the blue dots are the Delta 18 anomalies from um, uh, HADCM3, and then the red lines are the ice core values. So what we can see, which is good news, is that the lines are crossing where the blue dots are plotted. So that means that from the shapes that we've inputted into HADCM3, we're getting Delta 18 values, which are fairly close to uh, the observations in ice cores, which is good news because it means that we're doing something right. So what we'd like to do now is use that uh, Bayesian theorem to sample from this updated distribution on ice sheet shape. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to do that with this HADCM3 data as there's only 47 observations. So we had to turn to a method called Gaussian process emulation. This is a method used by statisticians when we're trying to work with a simulator that's very expensive, both computationally and financially, which had CM3 is. So it takes a day to run, you know, sort of 20 years of a simulation. And if you're trying to do, a, you know, a decent length uh, simulation, then it's going to take you days and days. So Gaussian process emulation. So Gaussian process is just a fancy word for normal distribution. You throw away all the physics and all the underlying theory behind your model, and you basically say, I've got some inputs and I've got some outputs, and I think I can model this as some kind of probability distribution. You can then compare it to what the simulator is doing and check that you're getting fairly accurate results. Um, so this was the output of my emulator. This is one of those things I was talking about where there's still some more analysis to be done. So the red dots are the values from HADCM3. And then the blue dots are our emulator. So it was actually quite surprising that we can see that our emulator actually isn't as variable as had CM3. It's really struggling to get these more extreme values, and it's really hugging the mean. So hopefully in the next few months, I'll be able to go back to that and see if I can make my emulator match had CM3 some more. Um, but we decided to put that to one side and move on in the interest of getting some interesting results. So um, since then, I've been using this emulator as sort of uh, my likelihood, so the distribution of D, and then combining it with my prior um, model to come up with some kind of relationship between ice sheet shape and delta 18 And this was one of my first results. So on the x-axis, we've got an uh, elevation anomaly from a pre-industrial control orography. So for all those elevations, I've removed the um, the pre-industrial controls so that we can just see how much it's, it is different from that. And the same with the delta 18 anomalies 
on the y-axis, so that's all had a pre-industrial control removed as well. So the dots are the values of um, had CM3, so we can see that there's quite a clear negative correlation between height uh, elevation anomaly and delta 80 anomaly. These black lines are the relationships that my methods uh, produced. So the way that method works is you just sample and sample and sample like thousands and thousands of times. So then I think this is just about 50 of those samples. So it then uses that uh, model to try and uh, predict delta 80 no values. So this red line is our ice core. These blue lines are what our model is producing. And then the vertical ones are the corresponding elevation variables. So we can see that there does seem to be an obvious relationship between elevation and delta 80 no. And the variance isn't too bad either. We're seeing it's probably about plus or minus one, 200 meters. So I haven't quite got down to determining what exactly I think the ice sheet was like at LGM. There's still a few more uh, analyses to run, a few more uncertainties to incorporate. But this is one of the shapes that we're getting out. Um, so for context, it's actually a lot, uh, it's actually slightly bigger than those prior shapes. And I've had to adjust the color bar accordingly. So it doesn't look quite as red as the others, but I promise it is higher. It's just that the color bar has been lengthened. Um, but something that's probably more informative is this. So this is the difference between that shape I just showed you that my method outputted and those four prior shapes, which I showed you earlier. So we can see that ice 5G, as I said, was a lot bigger than all the others. So there's, uh, so it is a lot bigger in central, but actually our shape is much bigger around the coast. And for the other three, our shape is producing a lot more ice in West Antarctic ice sheet. So as I said earlier, then, you know, this is something which we'd almost expect. There was so much variation in the Antarctic ice sheet that there is a chance that there's a lot more there than we've previously um, assumed. Uh, so to conclude, so hopefully I've convinced you that Bayesian statistical models can allow us to model, methods can allow us to model the uncertainty inherent in ice sheet modeling. So we can explore in more detail the relationship between ice sheet shape and proxy data and potentially many other things and that reconstructions of the West Antarctic ice sheet are showing a lot of variation and that this missing LGM ice may be somewhere around that region. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. We'll continue with Benjamin and we'll take questions after. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you all for joining us on what has been a really exciting day all about ice sheets here at the Cryosphere Pavilion. Um, it's really fun to get to present after so many fantastic other presentations. Thank you, Erwin and Jose Abel and Carlota and Fiona for giving really good introductions just in the past couple of hours to what I'm gonna try to summarize a little bit today and provide a different perspective on, and that's what we know about ice sheet collapse in the past from the paleo record. So why study paleoclimate in the first place? This is a graph from Clark et al. in 2016, where they looked at the difference between the projected changes in carbon dioxide and temperature relative to the carbon dioxide concentrations we know from the last 20,000 years and a reconstruction of global temperature that's based on a globally distributed proxy record. So you can see those in panels B and C. And then below that in D and E, they've plotted the rate of change of all those records. And what really just stands out is that when you look at temperature and CO2, the anthropogenic perturbation, what we're doing to the climate system right now, is something that we have no analog for in the last 100,000 years of the paleoclimatic record. If you do the same thing for sea level, however, we see that there are variations in sea level that approach the rates of change that we think we might face in the future. And so when it comes to the cryosphere, understanding ice sheets and sea level, the paleo record, even the recent paleo record, can provide a lot of interesting insights that can help guide us into the future. And I'll just give a little shout out. When you look back here 20,000 years in the past at those rates of sea level change that we get coming out of the reconstructed sea level since the last glacial maximum, there are a lot of changes in sea level that we still don't quite know where they're coming from. And work like what Fiona has just presented is actually really critical for us in figuring out 
which of the ice sheets that were on Earth at these various times, be they the present Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets or the uh, now mostly disappeared Laurentide and other LGM ice sheets actually contributed to those collapse scenarios. And so for the rest of this talk, I'm just going to give a little bit of uh, additional insight into the climate of the Cenozoic and how ice sheets have varied, why we, it, the ways in which we can sort of use paleoclimate to motivate our understanding of ice sheets into the future. This is a compilation record that actually comes from the deep sea. It's a delta 18 measured on foraminifera, which are little bugs that are found in the seafloor. What's really important to sort of take away from this is that black line shows an integrated signal, both of the temperature of the deep ocean and the amount of ice on Earth. And it runs from about 65 million years ago on the right-hand side to the present day on the far left. There's a secondary y-axis called ice-free temperature. When the black line is above that ice-free temperature, we make the assumption that there was probably no ice on Earth, that everything above that is just driven by heating of the ocean. You can see that this sort of uh, highlights some interesting periods in Earth history. For example, following the Eocene Oligocene transition, we move into this sort of uh, region where we're fluctuating right around that ice-free temperature line, which means we are starting to grow ice on Earth, and that uh, ice has been shown to have first grown in Antarctica. We also see that as we zoom closer to the present day into the ice ages, we're moving uh, very far away from that ice free Earth and into the period that's the more recent past that we've discussed a lot today, the Pliocene and the Pleistocene, when sea level variability has actually been quite high. Uh, we know that a lot of that sea level variability has been driven by CO2. And one of the reasons that we're most concerned about the Pliocene as a potential analog is because when we look at CO2 reconstructions, the Pliocene has a similar amount of atmospheric CO2 as to what we're seeing today. So this is, again, not covering quite as much time, but about 45 million years of both deep ocean oxygen isotopes, so that's the same black line that I was showing you before, and then before that, a carbon dioxide reconstruction. So I want to highlight that the ice ages, CO2 fluctuated between about 180 and 280 parts per million. I've highlighted that in the yellow box. The Pliocene estimates of CO2 are around 350 to 450 parts per million, and we can see where we are today at 407, as has been discussed. So the Pliocene remains a really intriguing analog for understanding what an equilibrium ice sheet response to the present day perturbation might be. I want to echo Carlotta here, who said something in the last time. As we continue to emit CO2 and as these numbers rise, you can see from these re reconstructions that we have to go much back further in time to the Oligocene, for example, in order to reach levels of atmospheric CO2 that are similar to a sort of business as usual scenario as we keep emitting. But because the Pliocene and Pleistocene represent the time periods where CO2 is most similar to the present day, they've been used as an intriguing analog for trying to better understand ice sheet response to past warmth. If we just zoom in on the Pliocene and the Pleistocene in terms of CO2 reconstructions, there are a number of methods that have been employed. Ice cores have been mentioned a few times today. Those are shown in the red bar on the left-hand panel here. But there are other geochemical methods for reconstructing CO2, one of which is a proxy in the ocean that comes from boron isotopes. And using that proxy, people have been able to extend the record of what CO2 has looked like in the past, at least through the Pliocene. And that's where we get these estimates that Pliocene CO2 was around 350 to 450 parts per million. Note that they've also done the work to calibrate this proxy against the ice core record so that we can trust that it's working well further back in the past. Again, you can see that the uh, amount of CO2 we have today is pretty well matched by, but we, by what we had in the Pliocene. We've seen this figure a lot, and it's, I, think because a, I think it's because it's a really powerful depiction of a summary 
of what we might expect the ice sheets to do under these different sort of climatic scenarios. And so I don't want to belabor this because uh, Carlota and so many others have explained it before. This is basically showing during past warm periods, we know that sea level was higher, we know that temperatures were higher, and yet we still have a lot of uncertainty about where that sea level came from. And so for the next couple of slides, I'm going to give you a little bit of information about what we think about the contribution Greenland might have made at various periods, a little bit of information about the contribution Antarctica might have made that will really piggyback onto what has been shown by Carlotta before, and then provide another perspective that we haven't heard about that some researchers are, are trying to use to understand ice sheet stability on these time scales. I want to talk about three different studies that have come out about Greenland. The first is a study that came out in the early 2000s, but is a very uh, intriguing physical evidence of Greenland ice sheet collapse. On the left-hand side is a reconstruction by Sven Funder, where he just sort of imagines what Greenland would look like if it had completely deglaciated, about seven meters of sea level equivalent. But what this paper shows is that there was a formation in far northern Greenland, so one of the coldest parts of Greenland today, where there are interbedded glacial tills and marine sediments. So what this is suggesting is that after Greenland initially glaciated, had quite a large glaciation, there would have had to be a relatively complete deglaciation to get marine sediments in these regions. That's what was argued. And for a long time, we thought of Greenland as being a relatively stable part of the sort of post-Pliocene world. And these kind of physical evidence that there might have been collapse was very intriguing and made us think, hey, once these ice sheets are developed, they actually can disintegrate. That was really driven home by another study that came out in 2016. Jose Abel talked about the um, GRIP and the GISP-2 ice core sites that were drilled uh, in the early 1980s, late 1970s. At the central part of Greenland, a deep ice core was recovered. And along with that ice core, they recovered a couple of meters of bedrock. That bedrock sat on shelves for a very long time. People thought one day they might do something with it. And in the uh, mid-2010s, a group at Columbia University analyzed that bedrock for the concentration of cosmogenic nuclides, which are compounds that only accumulate in the bedrock when it has direct access to the atmosphere, when there's no ice above it. Because we thought that central Greenland was probably pretty stable, if there were variations, they probably happened at the margins, what they expected is the concentration of these nuclides would be very, very low. And that's completely the opposite to what they found. In fact, they found that their measurements could only be matched if there had been significant periods of time when the Greenland ice sheet was almost completely gone. I want to just highlight the location of where this sample is from is really critical to the interpretation. Because this is the thickest part of the Greenland ice sheet today. And has, has been, as has been shown in a number of talks before, in order to deglaciate these more central regions of the ice sheet, you have to lose a lot of mass already from the periphery. And so this was a pretty shocking finding. And although it tells us a lot about the stability of the ice sheet, it cannot constrain exactly when or for how long the ice sheet disappeared. It can only put sort of upper bounds or uh, sort of end member scenarios. One of those end member scenarios is you would have had about 300,000 years of completely deglaciated Greenland as recently as 1.4 million years ago when CO2 levels were similar to today, similar to pre-industrial. The other scenario is you could have had smaller retreats during every single interglacial period when CO2 is about 280 parts per million. And then they suggest a third scenario, that maybe not all interglacials are the same, but during some interglacials, you get a longer period of exposure because for whatever reason, they're more strongly expressed. There was another study that came out in the same uh, issue of Nature, actually. I just want to highlight the ways that different studies can have, sort of find different things, but they can be uh, consistent with one another. So Paul Bierman's group also looked at these cosmogenic nuclides, which require that there be exposure, but he looked at them, his group, 
looked at them in sediments offshore Greenland from these IODP core sites. And what they found is there's consistent delivery of these nuclides indicating there was exposure over the last seven million years along East Greenland. And that means there must have been fluctuating glaciers, glaciers retreating so that this signal could accumulate in the bedrock, but then advancing again so that it could be delivered to the marine margins. So what they're finding is over seven million years, even when you might have periods of a lot of collapse, you still have regions of the ice sheet. And note that East Greenland has the highest topography. It's where the biggest mountains are. You still have these regions where you can host really dynamic ice masses. Carlotta already talked about Andrel. And so I'm just going to give a little bit of a recap of Andrew, but in the context of another project that my colleagues at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst have been leading to kind of try to tie these things together. So Andrew was this really um, unique project that recovered records from beneath West Antarctica that people thought were impossible for a long time. Similarly, there's a record from a place called Lake El Gigitkin in Northeast Siberian Russia that's a 3.6 million year continuous terrestrial record of climate change that we're just starting to see sort of link together our understanding of ice sheet fluctuations at the poles in response to interglacial warmth. Carlota already talked about Andrew, so I won't uh, go into it in any detail. These sediments were recovered from beneath the modern day ice shelf that indicated Antarctic, this part of Antarctica had gone from open ocean conditions to sort of ice shelf covered conditions to completely glaciated, covered by ground ice conditions multiple times during the Pleistocene. There was a question earlier about age models. The Andrel age model is, has a lot of uncertainties because you're in this very harsh environment where you're not only accumulating material, you're also removing it through glacial erosion. But they've done some attempt at correlating to try to show that for these multiple collapses where they might have happened with respect to global climate evolution, we're going to come back to that. The time period that's shown here covers the last three million years. I want to highlight that while it's really uh, critical that we have this direct physical evidence of Antarctic ice sheet collapse, its uh, sea level records have also pushed our understanding forward of when ice sheets may have collapsed in the past. And there's a really recent paper that came out in Nature that's really the first of its kind, where they've used a sedimentary sequence in New Zealand to reconstruct relative sea level during the Pliocene. And although mean Pliocene sea level remains a very complicated and controversial topic, what they've found, without suggesting anything about mean sea level, is that there were sea level variations on the order of plus or minus 20 meters during the Pliocene, a time when for uh, some people believe that the ice sheets would have been retreated and therefore relatively stable. And so accounting for this sort of amplitude of sea level change is another reason that uh, gives us another reason to try to better understand which of the ice sheets were collapsing on these time periods and what was actually driving that. So a professor at my university, Julie Brigham Gretti, uh, for a long time has been working on trying to recover a record from a lake site in northern Siberia that has kind of ended up tying a lot of this story together. And so I just wanted to highlight it because we haven't heard about it today yet. The motivation for collecting this record was that Julie looked at records from uh, Lake El Gigitkin, Lake Baikal, which is a big lake in Russia that's been used for paleoclimate reconstructions, Dome C in Antarctica, and also Northern Hemisphere climate, and saw that all of these things were very well correlated. And because there was a long, uninterrupted record of sedimentation at Lake El Gigitkin, they thought that this could be a really powerful way to fill in a gap that we've had for a long time. Like Carlota said earlier, any records that are older than a million years in terms of uh, paleoclimate and changes in ice sheets mostly come from the marine realm. This record comes actually from an impact crater. Uh, asteroid struck northeast Siberia about 3.6 million years ago. It filled in with water and it became a lake. 
you can still see actually the sort of ring, uh, the shock ring around the lake where the bolide impacted. But since then, it's been relatively quiescent and filling in. Um, it's important just to, if when we're thinking about the Pliocene, we've thought about this also as a time period when the boundary conditions of planet Earth, so basically where the continents are and how the oceans were circulating, is relatively similar to present day. That's why we have greater confidence in it as an analog. But when we're thinking about the Arctic, I just want to remind us that we're thinking about a mostly pre-glaciated northern hemisphere, a mostly continuous uh, high Arctic that had not yet been cut up by repeated glaciations during the Pleistocene Ice Ages. And fossil evidence suggests that the Pliocene in the Arctic was very different than today. There were camels living far up in northern Canada. And so this is, although we do use this as an analog for what we have, it's important to remember actually how different it was if this is the kind of future that our environment is headed towards. In any case, the Lake Okagikun record has been used to reconstruct 3.6 million years of climate change in the Arctic. And there's a number of publications about that. And I point you to those to learn more about this, because I just want to highlight a couple key findings. The really key finding from this record was that certain interglacials were what they termed super interglacials, much warmer than the interglacials around them. And this is a comparison of some climate reconstructions, starting with the Holocene, the period we are living in today on the far left, and showing also MIS-5, the Eemian, where the reconstructed temperature is sort of similar to today. But going back to MIS-11 and MIS-31, the temperatures were actually much warmer. What this means for the ice sheets immediately became a question that we've been striving to understand and we're still striving to understand. Importantly, what this record from the Northern Hemisphere has allowed us to do is to start to make correlations between what was happening in Antarctica when we think the Antarctic ice sheet collapsed and when we think ice sheet collapse happened in the Northern Hemisphere. And I'll just move through to say that there are these super interglacial periods that occur frequently throughout the record after about 2.9 million years, which have been assigned within the age uncertainty of the Andro record to collapses of the West Antarctic ice sheet. This is showing the time period during the Pliocene, about 3.2 million years to 2.2. If we just look at the Pleistocene, we can do the sort of same analysis and see that many of these interglacials, super interglacials, are occurring at times when it looks like the West Antarctic ice sheet was also at least partially collapsed and there were ocean, open ocean conditions at the Andrel site. And there are some sort of especially good matches where we do have the possibility of correlating these records um, to greater certainty because of the age models. This was also something that was discussed earlier today, but when you're trying to connect different records, it's really important you know how old things are, and so a lot of work goes in to making sure that when you assign these things to one another, uh, you're sort of actually synchronous in geologic time. So how are these things related and how does it relate to ice sheet collapse in the Pleistocene? The, one of the papers that discussed this record put out a mechanism that could sort of explain why ice sheet collapse at both poles could occur synchronously. I want to, um, for those who don't think about this all the time, there was also a really good slide in Jose Abel's presentation that showed the bipolar seesaw. In general, because there's an asymmetry in the Earth's relationship with the sun, changes that happen in the northern hemisphere happen in the opposite direction as those in the summer, so southern hemisphere. So as the northern hemisphere heats up, the southern hemisphere cools down in response to many orbital changes and also changes in heat distribution on Earth. The mechanism they suggest goes like this. You would have a collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet leading to a decrease in sea ice and ice shelves in Antarctica, you have these open ocean conditions that are seen in the Andrew record. That leads to a decrease in Antarctic bottom water production. That was discussed a number of times today that uh, Antarctica is an important place where really dense cold water forms and fills the abyssal ocean. That decrease in production of Antarctic bottom water would result in less Antarctic 
Antarctic bottom water going northward into the Pacific. Note that there are some, there's some independent evidence of this from IODP sites. That would lead to less upwelling in the North Pacific. So the North Pacific today is a region where cold water, nutrient rich cold water upwells to the surface and promotes productivity. And that, would, that reduction in upwelling could stratify the water column, resulting in a, making it more easy to warm that upper part of the water column and uh, causing a temperature anomaly, which could affect the placement of dominant air masses, the circulation of the atmosphere, and to also result in these sort of super interglacial elevated temperatures that we see in Siberia and that also may have driven a response from the Greenland ice sheet. And so I just want to give a, another shout out, piggybacking on Carlotta. This is a, I think, important step forward in linking together different records to understand how we can have ice sheet collapse from multiple different poles in response to global warming in a way that's similar to what we're predicting for the future. I want to highlight that for specific interglacials like MIS-11, we now have the opportunity through uh, getting additional records of testing the hypothesis that something like a super interglacial is what's responsible for driving some of these past ice sheet collapses and testing whether that mechanism that was proposed for driving these is something that we may also see in the future. Um, I want to highlight the International Ocean Discovery Program is really critical in our ability to obtain records that tell us something about the response of ice sheets on these time scales. I want to draw your attention to in Greenland, there's been work on this before, but we are also uh, hoping that there will be addition, additional expeditions planned around the coast of Greenland in the coming years that will give us really powerful new insights into the spatial variability of ice sheet collapse over the Pliocene and Pleistocene there. And this um, summary figure from SCARP and PACE, there's, or from the PACE program in SCAR, there's been a number of recent expeditions, both in the Ross Sea and the Amundsen Sea, that have gone and collected samples from really close to the Antarctic margin. And those have a very high potential for actually pinpointing when we had collapses of specific sectors of the ice sheet and helping us understand whether the mechanisms that have been proposed <laughs> are consistent with the evidence that we find in the geologic record. And with that, I thank you for your time, and we can take both of us any questions. Thank you very much, Benjamin. So, do we have any questions? Oh, Carlotta. Thank you, Benjamin, and uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, so I have a question about the super interglacials uh, because we do see also in our record, um, you know, the retreat of the East Antarctic ice sheet like in the MIS-31 and the MIS-11. There is other super interglacials that we don't see that retreat. And uh, I want to get your opinion because like we published that probably is the length, the duration of the, of the, of the heat. Um, so I want to get your insights on that if possible. Yeah, definitely. So I think that the, for the length, the duration in terms of the insulation forcing. Yeah. yeah. So one of the reasons that MIS-11, for example, is such a warm interglacial is because you have this longer duration of the insulation forcing. But there are also interglacials that we associate with really high sea levels, like MIS-31, where the duration is not as long and doesn't seem to play up at all. Um, I think... And also, I think it's a really good point about um, that there are regions of West Antar of East Antarctica that you see collapse during some interglacials, or that <laughs> sorry that we see retreat during some interglacials and not others. Um, I think it motivates. We sort of had this discussion this morning. Does waste always go first? I think what's necessary to understand why certain parts of the ice sheet respond to certain mechanisms and others may not, or certain forcings, um, is coming up with mechanisms that are actually testable, that we can look for in our records and test with our models. Um, it's possible that 
you know, for that some regions may be more sensitive to this long duration of the summer because that atmospheric forcing eventually becomes important and leads to destabilization. There's also a lot of important oceanic mechanisms for destabilizing the ice sheets. And so perhaps one of the things that we're looking at is that different sectors of the ice sheet are differently vulnerable to those different forcings. And we see that expressed in the paleoclimate record in their response to these different interglacials. Um, but it's, I mean, that's a really, it's a great, Question And I think the, um, what I w would highlight and think that we need to do, you know, this, the Lake Ogagikin is one example, but I do think that uh, looking for mechanisms that are able to link the response between the two poles is really important because we now know that both of these ice sheets are uh, responding to this interglacial forcing and whether they're responding together or separately and what are the mechanisms that potentially link them is really critical to our future projections. Thank you. Do we have any more questions for Fiona or Benjamin? Yeah, I have a question for Fiona. Uh, it was so fast, the last uh, slide that you oh, were showing sorry. about the results, uh, that I didn't really catch the magnitude of them when you were showing r your results for White House uh, uh, model and uh, Peltier and two other. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that, yeah, okay. Yeah, this one. So, uh, mostly in terms of uh, units, were so small. So, uh, what I, I want to mean is, uh, with this, so it is clear that two of the um, models, let's say, the mm. two in the bottom line, uh, are, let's say, uh, would, yes, saying symbol that they are mm. uh, doing well, but Peltier, for instance, is going to the other extreme. But um, to quantify this, uh, to what, I mean, what kind of information is this providing? Like saying that the likelihood that the Peltier model is correct or is in agreement with the, the data, to what extent? So uh, what does it mean in terms of quantification? So how significant is this? Can you say from these figures that, for instance, Peltier model is uh, likelihood that uh, this thing is correct is, I don't know, 25%, 60%, whatever? Um, I mean, that's a really good question. Yeah, that's not something I really considered yet. I, 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 put this plot together yesterday actually when it occurs to me that it would be informative to compare my shape to the previous ones. So this isn't something that I've looked into in any detail yet. Um, it was certainly very interesting when I started the research as new to climatology, I was sort of given a breakdown on how these shapes were uh, built and I was told that ice 5G, there was a lot of ice just sort of like thrown onto it um, to put it casually. And so when I saw these yesterday, I did kind of think like, oh, okay, that makes sense in my head that the um, what my model is predicting is less than what ice 5g is because if you consider that what I'm doing is taking all of these shapes from the literature as all possibilities then it's kind of natural that if ice 5g is sort of high up above the others then my model is uh, interpolating in between all these other values so the fact that I'm getting some where my shape is a lot higher than others but a lot lower as you can see in the top two in other bits then that kind of tells me that my model is doing statistically what you'd expect in that it is bringing these shapes together and working out where's the sort of mean shape in between all of these and then comparing it to ice cores to try and shift it a bit to give the values that we expect. But that's some, certainly something that I'll go back and think about as to what do my results say about the previous reconstructions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Hello, one more. <laughs> sorry. So that's uh, also for Benjamin, sorry. But um, I was wondering if the, so the Greenland record, uh, where you see this um, disappearance of the Greenland ice sheet, um, and you know, regardless of it is during one very long interglacial or different ones, um, do you know how that ice sheet configuration was? Do we have the hysteresis uh, problem? Was it so high as it is today that, you know, it requires melting to... Do you know where I'm asking? Yeah. Okay. The answer is no. 
No, uh, it's a it's a good question. The so the you know power of a record like that is that it completely changes our understanding of the stability of the ice sheet. The um, question it can't answer is like how did it happen or what did it look like or anything like that. And so what we have been using that um, record, we showed it a little bit in the presentation that I gave a couple of days ago. Oh, it's, and maybe I can pull it up. Though we've been using that record in um, concert with our ice sheet model to come up with realizations of the ice sheet model that are able to match that record and then use that to kind of back out what are the histories in terms of the geometry and the climatology that are able to produce this observation and then we can analyze those for what their fluctuations are. But again, having just one point is a, not a really strong, it's like what uh, Fiona is showing, you know, if you have like, all of these different ice core sites, then you have a much more power in terms of constraining the outcome. We just have one right now, but I will say that there's a, you know, concerted effort from a big team of scientists. I, there was recently a news article published in Science. There's been basal material found from the Camp Century ice core that was drilled in the late 1960s that sat on a shelf for 50 years and has now been analyzed using the same method and they found the same thing. And so by providing additional um, places where we're constraining it, our um, idea is that we can use models to kind of link those observations with providing the broader context of what that looks like for the whole ice sheet. But I think it brings up a, a really critical point. Yes, I mean, it, in the short answer is yes, hysteresis for sure plays a role also in the development and the collapse of the Greenland ice sheet, uh, as does the sort of climatology in determining where, you know, Greenland ice sheet seven meter sea level equivalent, where does the first meter come from? We don't know, but we're hoping that by combining the models and those kind of data, we can make more informed predictions about which of the regions in Greenland are particularly the first to melt. I mean, it's interesting too, because if you look at the uh, Dutton et al. reconstructions, we talk a lot about West Antarctica being this um, most vulnerable to ice sheet melting, but for many of these um, previous recent interglacials, we're um, assigning a lot of ice melt to Greenland and we're requiring that there come a significant portion from Greenland. And because Greenland is not today subject to the same kind of, to instabilities at the same scale as West Antarctica is, um, that forces us to ask what's causing that. And this, so this idea of you know a super interglacial or what makes one interglacial different than another, I think might be part of the key to unlocking the answer to that. Thank you. Last question for today. It's all clear. Wait, thank you so much both for these great talks. Um, thank you very much. So tomorrow we have a fantastic day focusing on permafrost the whole day. So make sure you don't miss it. And we will be starting at 11.30 with the first talk which will be on the permafrost in the S Rock report. So that will be at 11.30, live on Facebook or here, of course. Thank you and have a very nice evening. See you tomorrow.